thank uh, Ibtisam Latashi, uh, Sausan, uh, Safa uh, Bournan, and Rita for their hard, hard work and, uh, and collaboration. Uh, let me introduce to you Kautar Al-Maghrawi. Uh, Kautar Al-Maghrawi uh, graduated from uh, AUI in 2001 with uh, both a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in computer science. She is now acting as a principal research scientist at the IBM TG Watson Research Center. And uh, she has many volunteering activities, including co-chairing the Arab Women in Computing Worldwide, that has now more than 20 chapters uh, in, the, in the MENA region. Um, thank you, Kautar, for accepting our invitation. The floor is yours. Many thanks, Huda, for the great uh, introduction and for your welcome. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be uh, uh, among all of you today. And, uh, you know, we're very uh, happy, you know, to kickstart this uh, series of webinars, uh, hopefully, you know, where we're all going to meet uh, former AUIers, uh, you know, working in the technical field and also learning about uh, all the great stuff that they have, you know, embarked into uh, doing, uh, you know, in uh, technology and research and entrepreneurship and so on. Uh, so let me share my screen uh, just to start the talk. Uh, let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, we do. I'm just putting it in full screen mode. Uh, yeah, thank you. It's OK, great. So for today's talk, so I chose to talk about a topic dear to my heart, but also a very hot and trendy topic these days, which is uh, artificial intelligence and uh, what's happening, uh, especially in the research area with a focus on IBM Research Lab and, uh, you know, some of the key research trends that uh, will be shaping the future of AI and also what we have been uh, busy, you know, in the lab working on. So uh, my goal for this talk just to give you kind of a spectrum of uh, a wide variety of research activities and focus areas that we're focusing on at IBM Research and also kind of give, gives you a glimpse of what are really, you know, the uh, future trends in the field. So I work at IBM Research uh, TJ Watson uh, Center, which is uh, located in uh, 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 Yorktown Heights, New York. And this is actually the uh, headquarters of IBM Research Lab. IBM Research is one of the world's largest and most influential corporate research labs with an unmatched investment in basic research and core science and commitments to inventing the future of technology by making scientific breakthroughs. Uh, so these, you know, this page here shows some of the iconic achievements uh, from IBM Research, things like the uh, first, you know, uh, Watson computer that uh, wins, you know, champions at the Jeopardy game, uh, the world's first 50 qubit quantum computer, the, the world's first computer to, uh, you know, be able to uh, debate a human uh, and also almost, you know, defeat a human uh, debate champion. And, uh, and lots of other achievements. Uh, so, uh, you know, this, you know, just shows some of the numbers that attest to that, things like, you know, winning uh, six Nobel, uh, Nobel laureates uh, from IBM Research, 10 National Medals of Technology, and so on. And also, uh, we're still, you know, holding the number one uh, patent producer globally uh, for the 26th consecutive year. Uh, IBM Research is also a, a global capability. Uh, we have research labs spanning the globe from, uh, you know, the US all the way to Tokyo, Africa, uh, you know, China, uh, India, and so on. So, and uh, with more than 3,000 researchers globally. And the activities of our global labs reflect both local market needs and also the deep technical expertise found in these key regions of the world. For example, in Africa, we're developing commercially viable solutions to transform lives and spark new business opportunities in some of the key areas that matter to, to the African region, like agri agriculture, healthcare, financial inclusion, education, energy, uh, blockchain, and cloud computing. 
And going back to the topic of AI, so we've also had a long history of innovations in AI. And as you know, you, you all know, AI is not a new field. Uh, you know, research in AI has really started uh, many decades ago, and with some of really some of the early breakthroughs uh, also happened, you know, on our lab. Things like uh, the first working chess program in 1957, the first demonstration of machine learning checkers, the first also demonstration of deep learning, reinforcement learning using the complex uh, TD gamma and game in 1995, and more recently, you know, the human debate and the you know, and also the, the you know, the computer question answering uh, in the Jeopardy game. Of course, you know, AI is an old field, but many of the major breakthroughs and the impact we started seeing them more recently, especially attributed to the, uh, you know, huge success of deep learning algorithms. So, uh, as you all know, AI is everywhere, and uh, we it's also started influencing a lot of the things that we do, you know, even on a daily basis. So it is no longer the future for businesses, especially for businesses, it is the here and now. And the point that I want to make here is it doesn't really matter which industry you are in, whether it's travel, transportation, food delivery, service, or high tech. Uh, you are, you know, in the business of managing and selling content like movies and so on. AI, you know, is what all these successful organizations are using. And 85% uh, believe AI will deliver competitive advantage. And uh, and here, these are just some of the examples, you know, that many of you are aware of, like Netflix providing personalized recommendations, uh, Uber uh, delivering food, you know, that you like, you know, for example, in the US, in other regions where Uber is working, and also uh, relying on AI and artificial intelligence algorithms to uh, optimize, you know, the food delivery, uh, self-driving cars. We already started seeing, you know, prototypes with cars, you know, in the streets. I mean, it's still not wide adoption yet, but uh, this the technology has started, you know, to work and show some early promise. So some of these applications are very successful. For example, image tagging uh, that you see in Facebook, in Instagram, and so on. In the image, you know, in the area of computer vision, lots of successful applications. And also right now, you know, with uh, natural language processing and uh, voice recognition, we also see a lot of applications in uh, mobile phones and so on. They're all of them are using AI technologies. But some of these applications are also not uh, as successful, especially in the enterprise world. And why this is happening, you know? I mean, all of the AI applications are based, of course, on data and also algorithms, but also needs infrastructure. And although, you know, AI is already delivering some massive returns on investment, like you see in the examples here, uh, you can see some of the big numbers that show, you know, the cost savings, or the reduction in cycle lives, for example, in Samsung Electronics, or you know how much you know uh, revenue, additional revenue you can get, for example, in con uh, Continental Airlines schedule er scheduling. Lots of great examples. There are still challenges, and uh, and now you know that we're living you know through the pandemic. Uh, there is a race, you know, against you know this uh, COVID-19 virus. And uh, a lot of, you know, uh, the researchers, you know, whether it's in the healthcare or in also the supply or in, uh, you know, hospitals and so on, they've also started using some some form of AI or, uh, you know, machine learning algorithms or deep learning algorithms to help either accelerate drug discovery or help, you know, monitor, you know, health, uh, you know, uh, patients in the hospitals using automated uh, you know, control and surveillance and so on, or even try to maintain, you know, things like social distancing. These are some of the examples where AI can be used, for example, to uh, for public health monitoring to suppress the spread of the pandemic using uh, automatic uh, body temperature screening or, uh, you know, ways to enforce social distancing uh, by, you know, using monitoring tools or detecting facial masks and things like that. So these are just some of the simple applications, but there are different way more, uh, you know, uh, complex and uh, other. So if we really look, you know, where we are in the grand landscape. So what, as, as I showed, uh, there are several examples. And what, you know, I like to refer to those examples as a form of narrow AI, 
What do I mean here by narrow AI? It's a form of AI that has really begun to work and the progress there is undeniable. But this is, you know, uh, an AI where I have a very specific task in a single, you know, single task, single domain. And then we see that AI, you know, given large amounts of data, you know, works extremely well. But in this case, you know, here, you know, we talk about example, like, like for example, image uh, recognition or object detection, or these are really very spe specific tasks. So, uh, so the bookend of this story is a general AI. And here we say 20, 2050, but actually uh, we really don't know when this is happening. And uh, so this is a form of AI that's uh, revolutionarily, that's cross domain, that kind of mimics uh, how we humans, you know, reason and think and solve problems. So this capability is really way out there. So if narrow AI is today and general AI is decades away, so what's next? So what's next is a broader form of AI. Uh, and the distinction between the two here is, well, narrow AI is being dominated by these deep learning algorithms or paradigms. It has demonstrated that for single tasks, single domains, AI can achieve uh, you know, superhuman accuracy and sometimes even exceeds human accuracy in uh, model prediction. But the downside of that is that it requires large amounts of labeled data to train it. In broad AI, here we need to have much more like broader autonomy. And this is really the key, you know, uh, of the focus areas that we have in research. So in broad AI, we will need broad autonomy. We also need to be able to learn from less data and to be able to generalize across more tasks and more domains and more modalities. So this is really one of the core elements of it. And so, uh, and so here we we also have you know uh, an agenda to push the boundaries to general AI, and that is really neural inspired AI where the ability to work across more domains will be really more generalizable. So uh, if you see here, we're kind of here in this domain between narrow AI and and uh, general AI, where we can do more tasks across multiple domains. And we can also, you know, work on figuring out how to explain the AI models that we're uh, generating and how to make really AI essential for the enterprise and uh, easier to deploy. And so that's a lot of the focus area of the research that we're doing, you know, in this area of broad AI, which is really disruptive and pervasive. So, um, so even with narrow AI, we're still having many challenges. And as we're pushing the boundaries, you know, towards broader AI, you know, towards, you know, kind of the, you know, the uh, more general AI direction, uh, we're, we're still having a lot of, you know, uh, issues in terms of building AI models, operationalizing them in production, being able to trust these AI models. And this picture here shows the typical life cycle that you find when uh, you start, you know, your journey in AI. You first need to get the pre and prepare the data, and uh, and when it comes to data preparation, most of the time, a lot of the time, or almost like 80% or more of the time, data scientists spend is on data wrangling, data preparation. preparation. Okay. Uh, so. The need for AI, you know, uh, the need for data is really important and often in the enterprise there is a lack of massive labeled data and also lack of clean data because in AI garbage in garbage out. If you train an algorithm on good data, then you're going to get good outcomes. Otherwise, if you have noisy data, then the outcome will not uh, is not going to be good. Uh, then once you have the data, you need to build and train these models, and there are many point solutions today. Lots of you know uh, deep learning or AI frameworks out there. A lot of the innovation happening also in the open source community uh, that has span many layers. You know, it's really rapid, really down to the hardware, and and also there are no uh, patterns or abstractions. This is really a still an evolving field. Uh, and also, once you build these models, you need to test them and deploy them. And uh, 
as in software engineering, there are well-established CI/CD or we call continuous integration, continuous delivery methodologies, agile, uh, agile methods, and so on. And those also are started, you know, to be uh, applied in the uh, area of AI, what we call AI engineering. So we need to have, you know, really good CI/CD pipelines and methodologies for building AI models that extend not only, you know, uh, in your local uh, development environments, but you also need to take that into consideration for a, a rise, a variety of deployment platforms like Edge, private and public clouds, supercomputers, HPC environments, and so on. Once you build your AI model that predicts certain things or does maybe machine translation or, uh, you know, uh, summarization or something, some specific task, then you have to put it in a workflow and that kind of means integrating it into your applications. And here, composition of these AI models, sometimes you can have a, a, an ensemble of models that you have to put together, and then you need to figure out how do you manage these models, which ones to use, which ones to retire, and so on. So that goes into kind of how do you compose these models, how do you maintain them and manage them, and how do you integrate them e efficiently. And then once your application is being deployed in production, then you have to continuously monitor and evolve your AI models. And that requires also a set of tools and methodologies to figure out, is my AI still behaving as expected? What happens if new data or new patterns are being discovered? Do I need to retrain my AI models? Which models are stale? Which models need refreshing? Which models I should retire? So there is a whole field out there for just monitoring what's happening in the real production and being able to make sure that these AI models stay up to date and stay uh, uh, performing as expected. So this kind of shows the AI life cycle and there are lots of different you know, work in each one of these areas. There is a lot of research just on the data piece of it and on the model building where a lot of algorithmic advances on the test deployment building, monitoring, evolving, and and you know there is a whole new field that's emerged that uh, we like to call AI engineering and, or, and also AI DevOps. Okay, so uh, I've talked about uh, narrow AI and then broad AI and then some of the things you know that we need to work on to get us you know the patch of broad AI. Things like explainability, being able to explain the AI models, things like security, being able to trust and harden these AI models from attacks, external attacks or cybersecurity attacks. Things like ethics and responsible AI, being able to make sure that the model that we generate are not biased, they're still responsible, they're still, uh, they still conform to regulations. Things like also being able to learn from small data, not just I need to have, you know, millions of, you know, labeled data uh, so then my algorithm can uh, can achieve well. Often I don't have access to large massive amounts of data, especially if I am maybe in a factory or I have a new business problem and then I don't have I don't have enough. Uh, data that's uh, from the past to be able to build, you know, the data set. So what can I do in those cases where uh, I, don't, I have less amounts of data and I need to uh, still be able to train a new model? In that case, there are some techniques like transfer learning or even looking at neuro symbolic AI where I'm, I'm combining learning and reasoning. And then at the other end of the spectrum, these models, they live somewhere, they have to run somewhere, and often these models are highly computationally intensive and also produce a lot of, you know, uh, they, they, they also require large amounts of energy. And that also takes us to what do I need to make sure that I am running these models efficiently and also I can run large models in embedded devices or mobile devices where I am really constrained by the infrastructure, where I don't have enough, uh, enough bandwidth, enough memory, enough computational power, and I still have to uh, produce accurate results. Uh, so that you know, requires really looking at innovating at the physics of AI, at new accelerators, at figuring out ways to uh, compress these models, prune these models, and that's all, you know, looking at the infrastructure for scaling AI. 
So I'm going to touch briefly on some of these elements and especially what we're focusing on at IBM Research uh, to get us to this broad AI journey. So, uh, so the, the vision that we have here, I mean, uh, is kind of centered around these three uh, key pillars. The first one is uh, what we call neurosymbolic AI, which is a way to bring AI to the next level uh, and make it kind of reason uh, similar to what we humans do. And that requires kind of combining learning with logic, learning with reasoning. And this is what will enable us to learn with much less data and uh, in a, and also in more understandable and controllable fashion. The other pillar here is trust and automation. Uh, so these AI models for us to be able to deploy them, especially in uh, critical decision making situations or in real time, uh, businesses need to be able to trust the decisions that these AI models do. And that also, you know, you know, comes around, you know, the security ethics, being able to explain these black box models and also being able to automate a lot of the, these processes around building and deploying AI models, whether it is, uh, you know, in terms of the constructions, for example, of the deep learning architectures or in terms of managing the life cycle of the AI model. And at the end, you know, be, being able to uh, run AI efficiently across a large number of uh, deployment platforms, especially at the edge where there is a huge need for AI. For example, think about sensors, think about mobile devices, think about your smartwatch, think about maybe in the medical feed with all these sensors trying to figure out, uh, you know, healthcare, uh, monitor patients. So deploying models at these devices, you know, requires a whole new uh, uh, field of figuring out how to run these models efficiently in uh, constrained environments. So I'll start with uh, neurosymbolic AI just to give a quick overview of what it is and uh, some of the example uh, research work we're doing in the field in the space here. Uh, and uh, I'd like to start with this uh, the quote from Yann LeCun, who is one of the icons of AI, is a chief AI scientist at Facebook and also one of the uh, kind of the big inventors in the area of deep learning. So he said that we're really missing methods for machines to learn predictive models of the world. And until we have those which make take, you know, two, five, 10 or 20 years, we won't have machines with as much common sense as a house cat. So the idea is today's AI or today's deep learning algorithm, they're still really primitive in the way they think about the word and visualize the word and reason about the word. And maybe let's take a look at that through an example. If you, we look in the area of visual question answering, for example here, these are simple questions that we as humans can answer instantly or just requires a little bit of thinking because human reasoning is interpretable and is tangled. So we first draw uh, an abstract knowledge of the word or the scene via visual uh, perception, and then we use some logic re reasoning on it that would enable us to compose things accurately and generalize also the reasoning uh, in rich visual context. So for example, some of the questions like how many blocks are on the right of the three level tower? Or will the block tower fall if the block, uh, if the top block is removed? Uh, so here you're looking at really the balance of these uh, blocks. Or what is the shape of the object closest to the large cylinder here? Or are there more trees than animals? So for us, these are really simple questions. But uh, if you look at deep learning algorithms, they really fail uh, at answering these questions if you use just the pure uh, deep learning techniques. So uh, the work that we've done, uh, this is a collaboration with MIT, so our uh, MIT IBM lab research team, they uh, built uh, a system that combines what we call here neurosymbolic AI, both learning and reasoning. And the work that they did is achieved almost close to 100% accuracy by using a neurosymbolic approach. So what does that mean? Uh, what it means is here we're combining 
or we were disentangling reasoning from vision and language understanding. And you see here that we're kind of combining multiple domains. There is the visual understanding and there's also the language understanding. And, you know, going back to the point where we're talking about cross modalities uh, and cross domains, so vision and language. So here, uh, this is the paper that this uh, uh, describes in details the approach that was used uh, in this neurosymbolic AI technique. So the model that they built has three components. There is a scene parser uh, or what we call a de-renderer and then that segments the input image and then recovers the structural scene representation. And then there is a question parser uh, which is a program generator that converts a question uh, in natural language uh, in natural language into a program. And third, there is a program executor that runs the program on the structural scene representation to obtain the answer. So this just you know, explains it very high level that they kind of constructed the mini language of blocks and shapes. And they combined the visual understanding with the language understanding, generated the language, a program kind of the logic, and then applied that logic on the visual perception to be able to answer these questions. So this is an example where we can combine both learning and reasoning or symbolic uh, techniques to be able to address simple questions like, you know, visual uh, questions and think about, you know, taking this to the next level, you know, of really solving really complex domains or complex question. So uh, overall, you know, the vision that we have here for neurosymbolic AI is we like to think about every domain has its own language. Uh, so, and similar to us humans, the languages have been fundamental for us in terms of and, and communicating between. Bra, bra, is it possible to mute the participants? Uh, can you still hear me? Yes, yes, we do, miss. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so languages having the fundamental symbolic systems through which humans communicate. And then, so here, what we're trying to think of, you know, every domain, for example, in the domain of language for software, we have AI for code. In the domain of languages for human, we have AI for language. In the language of machines, for example, think about a factory or an assembly line where you have lots of machines that needs to be, uh, you know, producing certain things in an assembly or sensors that have to communicate between other to achieve certain tasks. So we have the language of sensors or AI for time series. And then in the language of chemistry, we have uh, AI for chemistry RxN, which is actually uh, one of the uh, products or the research assets that we have. And then this can be generalized to different domains where you try to construct, you know, the symbolic language that represents a certain domain, and then you apply AI or deep learning algorithm on top of that language. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about neurosymbolic AI and what we're doing at IBM Research, uh, we have a very rich web page with lots of details publications, projects, and also a lot of university collaborations. So I invite you, you know, to take a look at that if you're really interested in this uh, emerging and really hot area of research at this point. And uh, as an example, you know, AI for accelerated discovery or AI for accelerated science. This is an example where we kind of combined AI for language and AI for chemistry using generative AI models to identify knowledge gaps and generate new materials or new candidates for uh, for drugs. And that kind of uh, uh, goes, you know, nicely with what's happening today with the pandemic. And uh, especially this has become really an urgent matter for us as part of what we call the urgency of science to be able to solve some of the big challenges around healthcare, around around climate change and so on in the medical field and in lots of other fields. Uh, and here with a special focus on uh, accelerated discovery for uh, for drugs. So uh, this shows some of the work that we have uh, that came from IBM research around deep search, drug candidates exploration uh, and the medical literature navigation. 
And uh, this is also available, you know, online for uh, anyone interested, you know, to understand the technology and also to leverage it for their own research. So uh, IBM is providing free access to its COVID-19 knowledge graph, which is part of its corpus processing service. And what this knowledge graph integrates, it integrates COVID-19 data from various sources that are described, you know, uh, in the data page. And, and this also allows, you know, researchers uh, to, you know, be able to synthesize or apply uh, lots of algorithmic, uh, you know, advancements or innovations on this COVID-19 corpus. Uh, I'm just going to skip this and then go to the, uh, you know, I'd like to talk about, you know, generative AI briefly and what we're doing here in the space of COVID-19 drug discovery. So uh, as we, many of you might have seen, uh, AI can create stuff and this is using generative techniques. So it can create fake images, it can create music, fake news, and this is really all impressive, but why can't we really use AI to create useful things for us? So create, you know, generative models that can create new molecules, new drugs, new compounds, and we can discover key things faster and cut off on very costly research and development processes. Uh, for example, antimicrobial resistance in one application. Uh, and this is an example that shows some of the research uh, in the space here is can we, the question here that we're trying to address, can we create novel molecules and materials using AI at a rapid pace? So in the traditional drug discovery pipeline, this is really a time uh, consuming and cost intensive process. It really can take up to 10 years and cost as much as $2.6 billion for a new drug to reach the market. And we've lived that actually with, with COVID-19, it has really been accelerated Within a year, we have a drug right now, and a lot of the work also used AI in that process. So, uh, but you know, how can we scale this? Because I hope you know, we're not going to see other you know things. But this drug, you know, this virus is uh, you know transforming itself at a rapid pace, and I don't think this is just the you know the end of this. So we really need to accelerate also our scientific discovery process, and AI can play a big role in that. So to deal with new viral outbreaks and epidemics such as COVID-19, we need really more rapid drug discovery processes and generative AI models can uh, have shown promise for automating the delivery discovery of molecules and how they're interacting with each other. But there are still many challenges. This is an example that shows uh, web lab testing discovered two novel AI designed antimicrobials. Uh, with high, you know, broad spectrum potency and low toxicity. And using the ex experiment, you know, it took our research team 48 days, and this yielded 10% success rate compared to the typical process of two to four years, which is, and with less than 1% success rate with the existing traditional method. So uh, there is really a huge space here for impact, and I hope a lot of the research, uh, you know, will take this uh, really more seriously. Uh, and and here this is uh, the uh, demo, like a quick demo of the uh, you know uh, COVID-19 drug candidate explorer. Uh, that you know this is also available. You can uh, play with this, and then if you're interested in the AI of using generative AI for drug discovery, uh, you know we're putting a lot of of these data sets available to the public for our research. Okay, going next. Uh, so the next topic uh, I have here is uh, trusted and automated AI. So uh, what does it really take to trust a decision by the machine? Uh, so in order to trust a machine decision, we really need to make sure that first the decision is fair, that it's not going to affect individual users, communities, that uh, we need also to be able to uh, understand it and relate to it. And we also need to be able to know that the, the system itself is secure from tampering. And, and another thing is we need to be able to track, you know, the decision to the lineage or how it was made, which data or processes uh, have been involved in that decision. 
So that's what we call the lineage, you know, tracking the history of how this decision was made from it the day, you know, uh, the data was curated, pre-processed, cleansed, and so on, uh, because that also creates account accountability and transparency. So, uh, so a lot of the work happening in our lab is focusing on these traits, fairness, uh, explainability, security and accountability or, or transparency. And, and also, so how do we ensure that these uh, traits and characteristics and how do we encode them in real scientific and engineering principle and then literally instrument them into our AI models and AI pipelines? So let's first talk about fairness. Uh, so fairness uh, is is really uh, something really important to us as humans. So especially that machine learning models, they're increasingly used to inform high stake decisions about people. So although machine learning, you know, in its very own nature is always a form of some, some statistical discrimination, this discrimination, you know, sometimes becomes, you know, objectionable when it places certain privileges on certain groups of people or, or gives certain, uh, you know, groups some systematic advantage. And that's what we really want to prevent. So these are some examples, some very simple examples. Like if you look at image search um, and you search for the word, you know, scientists, you know, the, the results here show something that's really not representative of what who scientists are because you know, what's fundamentally wrong with this picture is most of the images shown here, they're images of, you know, old men or, you know, uh, you know, mid mid sized age man. Uh, there is no women here. They're also all like wearing like formal suits and so on. And that's not really a good representation of a scientist. Uh, in the area of language translation, for example, in Turkish language, they don't have the concept of who, he or she. And when we took, you know, she is a doctor, the machine translation give us he is a doctor, he is a teacher, it was translated to she is a teacher. And this just happened that the data was biased because it happens that most of the doctors were men and most of the teachers were female. And that also, you know, shows how that bias in the data translated into uh, the translation in the machine learning algorithm. And in chat, uh, yes. To interrupt you, there is a dialog box that was showing in your screen. And it's uh, kind of, uh, yeah, thank you. Sorry. Uh, thanks. I didn't, I didn't realize. And then, um, and then the other, you know, uh, example here is in chatbot. Chatbots also can learn to discriminate or uh, spit, you know, racist comments, especially if they learn that from uh, the inter how they interact with people. And this was a famous example by Microsoft uh, the uh, chatbot that also learns, you know, to uh, say, you know, xenophobic and then a racist remarks by interacting with people. So these are, you know, some simple examples. There are many more examples that especially we have seen today and that IBM, you know, IBM stopped its image recognition service just because of this issue of bias in the, uh, you know, in the lights of what's happening with Black Lives Matter and so on. So, uh, and uh, there is a, a lot going on also uh, in terms of AI and how, you know, it can be used to discriminate. So this really becomes a very important research agenda for us. And, you know, uh, this is also across the industry. So where can you in intervene in the AI pipeline? So there are different ways, you know, you can uh, detect and mitigate bias. And that can be done at the pre-processing phase of the algorithms when uh, especially apply to the training data, the data you use for training. If you can modify the training data, then pre-processing can use. If you have access to the learning algorithm, then uh, in-processing can be used for mitigating the bias. Or if you don't have access to the training algorithms or the, uh, the data, then there are techniques that you can use post-processing uh, that you can apply to the predicted labels. So these are just show some of the techniques and uh, part of the effort, you know, for us to deal with this complex issue, we have created an open source AI fairness toolkit that we call AI Fairness 360, which is the most comprehensive toolkit for addressing bias in AI pipelines. Uh, and as you know, bias affects AI mainly through the data. 
it has been trained on. So it encodes our prejudices, uh, prejudices and imperfections. So what AI Fairness Today does, it has over 30 bias uh, metrics, check and checkers and algorithms that allow you to check your data for or your models for bias. And it also has, you know, many state of the art algorithms uh, that have been contributed by IBM, but also from outside, you know, academic uh, contributors and, and also industry researchers. So this is an open source toolkit. We invite everybody to participate in it and kind of to advance state of the art. And so it's not just an IBM thing. Uh, I mean, it was created by IBM researchers, but uh, it also encodes lots of the algorithms, like top algorithms from uh, from uh, you know academic uh, contributors, researchers, and also other industrial contributors. So you know, if you're interested again in the area of AI fairness and bias, this is a great starting point. And uh, you can uh, today you can go uh, visit this uh, website. You can check the code, you can look at the tutorials. It's really a great resource. So the other topic which is very important also uh, is explainability. So moving to explainability, explainability uh, explanations you know, are at the core of how we navigate the world. And we humans are very good at explaining things. We use examples, we use counterfactuals, and part of the the work that we do at IBM Research is focusing on how do we teach AI to do the exactly same thing or even maybe better than us. So um, I'd like to start with this example uh, which shows how we, are we can use contrastive explanations which is an algorithm and there is a reference here to the paper that was uh, published at NURIPS 2018. So if you're uh, like the uh, Sherlock Holmes, uh, you can remember that, uh, you know, in his book, The Adventures of the Silver Blaze book, he famously solved the crime by realizing that the dog did not bark. So what's missing here is important. And uh, so when you're alone, when, for example, in the case of loan appro approvals, if you have a loan that it's denied, you're not going to ask why uh, or how, you know, you're really, you're going to ask, how am I going to get approved next time I apply for the loan? If you're a doctor, for example, you're going, uh, you're going actually to diagnose the patient, you're going to be focusing on symptoms that are absent. Is it the flu or is it pneumonia? Is it, you know, fever or is it, you know, what's missing here? And then, so what this algorithm, you know, does is very similar to these examples. So it tr tries to look for the features that are important for the decision, but it also identifies the minimum set of features that could actually reverse the decision. So if you look at the examples here in the image, so we can deduce that the image is three because we observe that the curves are present, but also that this dash here on the top is absent because if that dash was present, this could be reversed to be interpreted as number five. So this just shows, you know, images being used to explain this decision, but, uh, you know, this is not uh, only work for images. This can, uh, this can be, you know, generalized to text, generalized to video, to speech and so on. So this is an example showing how we can use this, you know, finding the missing algorithmically uh, to be able to explain certain decisions uh, that AI is making. And, uh, and here, this kind of shows the overall framework that we use here when uh, in the AI Explainability 360, which is another toolkit uh, from IBM Research that has a lot of the algorithms around explainability and also the, that we invite the research community to contribute to. Uh, and here it shows that there are different ways of providing explanations. There are direct explanations, global direct explanations uh, to make the model itself understandable. And the way this is doing is while you know, you're training the model, you also train at the same time an interpretable model. Think for example, like a decision tree. Deep learning is black box. It's really hard to understand what's going on but you can create a surrogate model, a decision tree that mimics what the model is doing. And that's, you know, decision tree model or a surrogate model will help you explain the decisions that your deep learning model is doing. 
So that's just one example, one approach. Okay, so moving to security. Of course, security is so important. You know, if you cannot trust these models, if somebody can easily tamper with these models, then you really cannot use them in production or in, in your real uh, applications. And here I have some examples, you know, that shows why we should be concerned here. Uh, so why are we concerned when it comes to, uh, you know, AI models? Because adversaries can, can craft adversarial inputs, certain inputs, uh, in such a way to enforce a particular decision or a particular classification. And, uh, and here, for example, in the case of uh, model evasion or, uh, you know, evasion attack, you can fool a model with adversarial examples. For example, you can add some in, imperceptible, like very small noise that you cannot, we cannot perceive as humans. You see these two pictures, they pretty much look the same to us. But the, se the, the second picture here on the right, it has some noise added to it that makes the deep learning algorithm interpret the, the picture as something else, not as a, as a panda, but as something else. And this is a very popular technique, you know, that attackers can use to tamper with the data sets in such a way that you can fool the model that's predicting. Uh, and uh, another case of attacks is the poisoning attack. So here also you can manipulate the training data to to cause the target model output or to corrupt the model. So here, what the adversary does with access to the training data, they can insert a backdoor or a poison into the training. And the backdoor will be silent and only detected or kind of will manifest itself when certain things are triggered. For example, here, uh, you know, the model will be performing as usual. It's, think of it as a virus, you know, when it detects certain patterns, then it will start, uh, you know, acting up. So here in these, uh, in this example, we have two pictures of a stop sign. In one of them, if you add sticky notes, then uh, the, uh, the model, you know, the model, the AI model will interpret the stop sign as a speed limit. And just think of that, you know, this can be really dangerous, you know, in the area of self-driving cars, uh, because that, you know, kind of going to cause accidents or, you know, really cause loss of life. The extraction attack is basically what, you know, these attackers do to steal the model. So what they do is they kind of uh, reverse engineer how the model work. And the, uh, so, this kind of steal the model by replicating a given machine learning model via open AI access. And they send, a, they prop the model uh, a large number of times, like thousands of hundred thousands. Uh, and they kind of reconstruct the model decision boundaries. And they steal the model. And here you can see an example of two like uh, vision models where the stolen image using an inversion attack and the original training image. And for us, you know, these two images, they look pretty much uh, very, very similar. Or even you see some distortions, but the stolen model is doing pretty much a good job approximating the real model. So these are all really dangerous things, you know, that somebody can do and uh, compromise the security of your models. And all of this calls, calls you know, to an action. Uh, so what should we do uh, to make sure that these AI models are secure? robust. So, so safety here is obviously the number one issue on everybody's mind. And what you see here playing is the background in the background is a demo of ART or what we call adversarial robustness toolkit. So this is also the most comprehensive toolkit of attacks and defenses, which was uh, created and released, uh, you know, I think uh, last year, a couple of years ago. Uh, and this is still a very hot area of research for us. We like to create also attacks because that's how we kind of study how to defend them. And it's kind of an arms race, you know, as AI models are, you know, being developed or are being advanced, the attackers also are advancing their techniques of how to compromise these models. So this, this is an important area of research that, you know, should always, you know, continue evolving to make sure that new AI models are not, uh, are not compromised, are safe. And, and going to the area of automation, I'm just doing a quick time check. So uh, 
data science is a, is kind of an art, uh, especially if you look at the area of uh, deep learning. Uh, so today's, you know, deep, deep learning networks, they're extremely complex and they easily reach, you know, millions of parameters per network. And part of the complexity is synthesizing, you know, these really uh, crafted architectures uh, in the, the area of computer vision. There are these convolution network architectures uh, that has some really sophisticated connections and so on and properties in the area of machine learning, you know, uh, natural language processing, you know, uh, the transformer architecture, there is LSTM architecture, there are lots of different, you know, variety and flavors and uh, they rely really on very clever techniques and and also on many years of expertise and mathematical uh, you know understanding and statistical understanding to be able to generate new neural networks that are efficient and that also requires also a really uh, deep expertise so this makes the area of deep learning kind of an area for highly skilled data scientists that are required to create good neural networks and doing that they must decide the number type order of layers to be used size depth of the parameters of each layer the connections of the layers what nonlinear functions you have to put between the layers lots of details here and this expertise that's created by each data scientist synthesizing new neural networks for new data sets or new domains is really totally lost after they finish their work. It's not transferred to their colleagues. Uh, failed experiments are generally trashed and so on. And, and so this really makes this approach not scalable. And that's what the area of automating AI tries to, to address. How do we automate hyperparameter tuning? How do we automate feature engineering? How do we even automate the neural network synthesis? And this is a very hot area of research right now. Uh, and uh, with lots of great results that showing that some of the automatically uh, created neural network architectures even, you know, surpass the ones that are, or, you know, at least, you know, match the performance of the ones that uh, were handcrafted by, by humans. And going to the life cycle that I mentioned, uh, Operationalizing the end-to-end -end life cycle is a very also important area here, and that looks at managing the entire life cycle in a very engineering uh, and scientific way, and looking at you know the data automation, the data science automation, and also the life cycle automation in terms of staging, uh, pre-production -pro -pre staging, pre-production and production and then analyzing, improving, and monitoring, and making sure that your AI is delivering what the business is expecting it uh, to deliver. And uh, much of the focus, you know, is what we call this AI engineering uh, life cycle. So, uh, so that brings me to the end, you know, of uh, uh, the presentation here topic, which is efficient AI. So, and this is all about accelerating uh, the running and then and, and the scaling of these uh, big AI algorithms. So, if we look at the example here, this is one example of narrow AI, which does a simple image recognition task. And one model can take up to two weeks of home energy consumption. And also one model uh, can take, you know, uh, needs a large number of GPUs. These are the graphical processing units accelerators from NVIDIA to be able to, uh, you know, run this model or train this model in reasonable times. But still it takes hours, days, and sometimes months to uh, train these uh, big neural network algorithms. In the area of NLP, this is even, you know, more profound and much more costly. So deep learning models have brought a lot of success in the area of natural language processing. Think about, uh, you know, search, think about machine translation, think about question answering, think about lots of areas in natural language processing. And uh, we're still at the beginning of this. However, these improvements, they come at a uh, big cost. The computational resources required and the time consumed add up to the overall tweaking of the model. 
And NLP models, especially, you know, you see that bigger is better in NLP models and these numbers just to show the size. Here we're talking about models that have billions of parameters. And look at the cost here. The cost to train one model can go as much as, you know, thousand, you know, here, if you look at the number here, it's uh, the cost can be like $20,000 or, you know, even sometimes $44,000, uh, which is not unsustainable. And, and also look at the energy uh, emission or energy consumed. So these days, you know, the total cost of training an LLP model can really climb into millions of dollars. And, and sometimes you need to do many more, many experiments to be able to figure out what's the right accuracy or the right, uh, you know, uh, methodology to use. So cost becomes a very important uh, equation here and, and also energy uh, consumption. And like we've seen uh, with Moore's law, you know, the, this picture was also, it depicts that there is a tremendous growth in network complexity and sizes, which also translates, as I mentioned, into high computational talk, uh, cost. So if you look at the compute requirements to train AI models over the last five to six years, of some of these flagship demonstrations uh, that we see in the popular press and so on, the compute requirement is doubling every 3.5 months. We used to be uh, impressed with Moore's law, which was doubling every two or almost 18 months, but now this is, you know, really much faster than ever before. And that kind of calls the, you know, research community to think about, okay, how can we, what can we do to sustain with this uh, tremendous need of computational power and energy? We need to really be able to have uh, efficient AI or uh, green AI. So, and that's the mission of the IBM AI Hardware Center, which is actually uh, the work I'm focusing on these days. So this center, we built it, uh, you know, uh, actually next month marks the second year anniversary of the center with the focus on enabling next generation chips and next generation in uh, uh, accelerators that support this tremendous processing hour uh, power and unprecedented speed that ai requires and and here uh, in the center we're focusing on uh, you know these areas uh, reduced precision accelerator meaning uh, doing AI computation in a reduced floating point. Uh, you don't need 32 bits uh, floating points, you know, to do the AI computations. You can get away a lot with, uh, you know, 8 bits, even going down to 4 bits for training that we have recently demonstrated in a research paper and even going, you know, to 2 bits and even thinking about 1 bit for inference. Analog computing takes this to a whole new level with, uh, with and promises, you know, up to 10,000 speed up in terms of AI compute efficiency and going even beyond classical computing and analog computing to quantum computing. And here the possibilities are endless and with speed up, that's way more than 10,000 uh, X improvements. Uh, so that's, you know, our roadmap in terms of the future of AI hardware, which uh, we're trying to extend the performance of AI that you see here by 2x every year through 2025 and, and even beyond that uh, with using techniques uh, centered around uh, approximate computing for digital technology you and even looking at analog technology uh, which can potentially you know add another 100x in energy efficiency because in analog you're basically doing in-memory compute uh, as opposed to digital, so you're combining, you're doing in place uh, computations and memory uh, in the same place, which tremendously uh, reduces the cost and the energy of these uh, AI models. And what's possible with 1000x improvements in AI compute? Really lots of, you know, radical changes uh, are expected over the next decade, uh, powering, you know, smart cities and industries, in many areas, uh, especially, you know, in multimodal areas like autonomous vehicles, in robotics with industrial robots and agricultural robots, in healthcare, in manufacturing, uh, in natural language processing with reasoning uh, 
and, and many other areas, and especially uh, while doing this while reducing the carbon footprint of AI. And also uh, accelerating AI with quantum computing is also another big focus that our quantum research team is, is working on. I'll just skip this and like to end with this. What really lies ahead? Uh, so a lot of the work we do, we try to reflect on these revolutionary technological changes in the industry and also our societies. And there is just, you know, we're still at the beginning of this. Uh, there is still so much to lie ahead of us uh, in terms of AI really being truly everywhere, bringing us deeper insights, uh, allowing us to engage with each other, with the world, with the machines in whole new, uh, you know, dimensions, providing personalization at scale and and also a completely instrumented planet. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Qatar, for this valuable uh, presentation. It was I learned very much. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, about what you are doing, uh, the future of AI, etc. Uh, I open here the floor to questions. If you have any question to ask to Kautar, please raise your hand or you can send it through the chat. So I'm going to stop uh, uh, screen sharing just to uh, okay. ma make sure I can see the chat. OK. Otherwise, I, I, I have uh, frankly, I have prepared a couple of questions based on uh, on the topic that you sent, that you shared with us. And uh, some of the, que I mean, many of the questions that I was asking myself and uh, attempting to to uh, to ask uh, were answered uh, during your presentation, especially with those that are related with the AI and bias and what are the, po uh, I mean, the, the techniques and uh, that you are using in IBM to uh, to overcome this problem. Uh, but I'm not sure if you answered the policies in terms because still, I mean, we can uh, 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 have algorithms, I mean, uh, uh, put models that uh, uh, avoid uh, whether it is gender, religious, ethnic bias, etc. However, is there any policies that are put at the level of the organization in terms of hiring? Uh, uh, I mean, and the uh, types of researchers I I implicated in the uh, in the work you are doing. Uh, this is from one side, and uh, from the other side, is uh, should it be uh, kind of uh, at the government level uh, or at the global level uh, uh, to establish policies in order to make sure that those technologies are not uh, uh, affecting. Uh, I mean, the uh, uh, our lives. Yeah, that's a very excellent question, Huda. Thanks uh, for that. Um, definitely, you know, I think right now a lot of the focus has been so far on, you know, at the algorithmic level, how can we do that? But, you know, really making this operationable government and, you know, agencies, uh, you know, working with technological institutions and so on need to infuse all of these things as policies into the life cycle, you know, of the AI application. And that's, you know, this work that we've started in research, but we're also taking some of this into our production. But again, that requires working with government, like you're saying. So uh, there are lots of councils and, but this is still a uh, work in progress in terms of forcing or uh, making, for example, a company accountable for not applying these policies. Uh, because first you have to be able to measure that uh, in uh, like an algorithmic or technical way. So you can have maybe a government come and do audits to make sure that is your AI model, uh, you know, fair, whatever you're doing. And we have a big a research effort that we call fact sheets for AI. So this is something uh, really new out hot of the press. Uh, that we released recently. It's also, uh, you know, uh, similar to what we have AI uh, 360, Fairness 360, Explainability. We have now Fact Sheet 360. So what we mean by a fact sheet, think of it as kind of the nutritional label for a, an AI model. When you buy a food, like when you buy like some packaged food or some juice or something, there is always, a, you know, on, you know, on the food, some label telling you, okay, these are the ingredients 
this is how many calories, this is where it was made, this is where it was manufactured and same, things like that. And even giving you things like you, you shouldn't use this product in this way, okay? Because if maybe you use the fridge, we apply more uh, power to this fridge, you're going to burn it. Or So we really need to do the same thing for the AI models, have kind of a fact sheet or a, a label associated with every model that tells me, okay, what is this model doing? How, how did it, was it built? Did it, uh, does it have any bias? Okay, was it checked for these metrics? What are the bias uh, mitigator that were applied to it? So it's really something that we really have to infuse. Uh, so we propose the concept of fact sheet, uh, and then we're hoping that others adopt the same idea. And, and then also government enforce these regulations. So we're really in the early stages, but at least the technology is being developed to allow government and so on to make these enforcements. So that's all part of the uh, this transparency, uh, uh, enforcing the transparency. And we kind in IBM Research, we also recently uh, created this department called Responsible AI or Responsible AI Technologies. And the whole focus is on all these trust methodologies spanning from fact sheet, explainability, bias, but not just creating maybe point solutions, but how do you integrate that into the life cycle of the application in the cloud? Like in our cloud, uh, we have some of these technologies already being in production. But again, for a wider adoption and to make this mainstream, that requires much more than that. Yeah, indeed. I mean, uh, we're still. I mean, you, you gave an, a great example about that, like the uh, the the description in uh, in products, and we are still. We, uh, Despite, I mean, the efforts that done with the products, where still uh, companies could still have uh, ways to bypass these uh, these descriptions and uh, yeah, and disguise this. Uh, when it comes to AI, it's uh, it's another story. Uh, anyways, I mean, uh, my uh, my second question, if nobody uh, has. Just one second, yes? please. We have a question here in the chat. Uh, yeah, sure, it is from sure. uh, from Naima. She says, "How do you see the use of AI-powered application in the teaching process?" Would it be feasible and effective? Yeah, also another great question. Um, I mean, definitely there are lots of areas where you can infuse AI in teaching, especially now with remote learning. Uh, so think about, can I, for example, uh, you know, use AI to help uh, under maybe uh, deliver, you know, certain content, understand from the cues of the different students, which things is, uh, which you know maybe topics need more focus uh and also how do we how do you explain some topics to different uh age groups and so on i mean that's not my my area of expertise but i can imagine a, you know a lot of applications ai powered education uh that you know where you can infuse ai especially in the delivery you know of the process but also in monitoring the feedback from the students to understand how the students are, uh, you know, responding. But there is also work in the, uh, like, uh, the VR, AR, like the augmented reality, to be able, for example, to deliver uh, more interactive environments. For example, think about teaching chemistry or teaching physics or teaching certain topics that require students to touch, you know, the environments, to interact with it and so on. For example, now with the pandemics, it's very difficult for maybe uh, chemical teachers or physics teacher, chemistry or physics and so on to deliver some of the contents because the students need to be in the lab and they need to be physically present and touching things. So, I mean, there is work that looks at, you know, what some, some of the augmented reality, virtual reality that provides kind of an immersive experience for the students to be able to visit museums, to be able to touch things and as if they are in the real physical world. I mean, that, you know, can have application just beyond the pandemic, because maybe that allows students in regions, for example, like uh, Africa or poor regions to have access to knowledge that they wouldn't, uh, you know, otherwise have access to. So I think lots of applications in the uh, online education, but even, you know, in the classroom itself, in terms of monitoring, but in terms also of delivering the contents. Okay, is there any other question, uh, Ibsisa? 
Uh, yes, actually we have two. <laughs> and uh, well, the first, I, I've been, uh, uh, I mean, uh, advise. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, Kautal mentioned to me before the, this uh, this meeting that she has only a few minutes after after the talk because she has a meeting. So we go. We will go okay, quickly well, through the question. Maybe for the last one, maybe. Yeah. So um, yeah, let me browse up because it skips like. Um, yeah, so can you please recommend the hardware available to implement AI algorithm like deep reinforcement learning? Okay, so in terms of hardware today, you know, state of the art, you know, you need uh, to have access to GPUs. Um, and uh, so I'm not sure where you're working. Is it like in your university and so on? But there are also lots of uh, cloud environments. For example, IBM provides uh, you know, AI frameworks and then runtimes where you can do training and so on. But there is also, you know, other environments like the Amazon and AWS and then the Google Cloud. Google also provides lots of free resources in terms of like the Google Colabs and uh, and also Jupyter Notebook environments where you can run your experiments on uh, Google's uh, TPUs, for example. Uh, on IBM, also, we have the Watson Studio environment. Uh, I, I'm not sure if that addresses your questions. I mean, your question is about reinforcement learning. But in general, if you're doing deep learning you and you're building deep models, and if you're training these models, you need to have access to uh, big amounts of resources. So, uh, I mean, the best way today is to, to use some of these available resources either in your own lab or in the uh, cloud. And one other thing I think that you also you might have to pay attention to some of these frameworks, you know, provide some optimizations like reduced mixed precision or reduced precision or distributed deep learning that allows you to scale your training so that it, it doesn't take like days and so on for your models to train, but you can reduce it significantly to like few days or hours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kautar. I will ask, uh, still I will ask <laughs> my last question. Sure. Uh, I mean, uh, you have a great experience I, and, uh, and uh, I mean, uh, uh, your valuable uh, knowledge uh, uh, with your no valuable knowledge. How can we assure this kind of transfer of knowledge that you have uh, uh, within, I mean, uh, uh, your company to, uh, uh, to, uh, to Morocco or, or to uh, our region, uh, including, I mean, um, I'm talking about the African continent or, or the MENA region, especially that I saw a, a small map that you displayed with research labs and where uh, no of, none of the research labs were located in, in our continent. All the research labs are uh, dispatched in all the continents except Africa. So how can we assure uh, a transfer of knowledge and also between the university, Al Khawain University, you know that we just, I mean, Al Khawain just launched a day bachelor in artificial intelligence uh, last year. And we, uh, the new programs, master programs has been launched uh, this year as well, including uh, digital transformation. How can we collaborate in this, uh, in this aspect? So uh, I think there are different, uh, that, that's a good question and lots of, you know, some of it needs more brainstorming. But uh, some of the concrete ways that I can think of is, uh, I mean, we provide some of these open source, uh, you know, capabilities, like I mentioned. So I think certain projects, for example, could use some of these. And then we also provide for all of these open source uh, uh, research projects, Slack channels, where you get to interact directly with the researchers working on that area. So I think for students, I think maybe some of the projects that you're doing uh, in your classes, it would be good to incorporate some of these capabilities, uh, you know, to, for example, if you want to learn about fairness, uh, I think it's a great way to maybe go and then explore what AI Fairness 360 is doing, use some of the algorithms and then take an example and then run the example, explain it, or even take maybe a new algorithm uh, and then apply some of these uh, fairness mitigation techniques. Uh, so I think providing hands-on experience to the students and also the researchers is a great way, especially in the area of AI. And there is so much, you know, online, you know, that's coming from us, but also from other institutions in, in, in open source. Um, so that's one way I think of it uh, is incorporating in your projects, uh, in your courseware, 
real examples and then using, uh, you know, maybe research technologies or open source projects. Uh, and sometimes we have also, uh, you know, open call for code where we invite everybody from uh, academia and, uh, you know, students and so on to participate. And we also provide guidance like mentoring and so on to the students. Like the example that we did with the Open Z, the, the Z platform. That was an example. So I'm hoping that more students can get engaged with that and faculty. Uh, internship is also another way, another great way to, I think the best way for students to get exposed is to have an internship. Um, and right now, I think be, with the pandemic, there are some limitations, but I'm hoping we can get beyond that because before we used to bring interns from overseas, but now because of the pandemic, all the internships are remote. So we're only given internships in the US to the US students. But uh, I'm hoping that this will be relaxed soon after you know we get beyond this uh, <laughs> pandemic phase. Uh, but again, I think mentoring and then looking also for collaborations, faculty and research collaborators. Uh, IBM also provides lots of faculty, uh, you know, fellowships and student fellowships. We also have an AI residency program for students to apply to, especially for PhD students. Uh, and maybe Huda, we can discuss this offline. There are different yes, ways. Sure. I think we can look for ways to collaborate um, and also how to get students more engaged in hands-on projects and then and work more on this transfer of knowledge. Okay, thank you very much, Kautar, uh, for your valuable. <laughs> These are working moms. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Kautar. My and, pleasure. Uh, yeah, looking yeah, forward. If there are any other questions, uh, please feel free to contact me through LinkedIn or uh, I'll be happy, you know, to yeah. ask any other questions. Uh, okay, thank you, Kautar. Uh, if there are no more questions, like I will uh, let you go and uh, we will see each other again. All together next Certainly. this Friday, the other Friday. We okay, didn't speaker. Thank you very much, Kosa. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.